Welcome to our webinar, um, Understanding and Overcoming the Unique Barriers to Care for People with Diabetes and Depression. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, but just wanted to tell you a little bit about kind of, you know, the sponsorship of this webinar. Um, the, the, the Minnesota MCL Collaborative is a group that we work together on these three-year projects, um, one of them being current one is Diabetes and Depression Performance Improvement Project, or PIP. Um, and our aim is to focus on addressing uh, the co-occurring conditions of diabetes and depression. Two of those top conditions um, in our seniors um, and SNBC populations. Um, this is a third webinar that our collaborative has sponsored um, and, and put on um, since the beginning of the year 2024. And it's part of a series of webinars that the collaborative um, is sponsoring to kind of put information and tools in the hands of those of you who are working directly with the members, kind of those boots on the ground folks um, to improve people, uh, the health of the people with diabetes and depression. So we're happy that you're here today. And uh, if you can just do the next slide, um, and then I'll just do the introduction with Molly. And this is just kind of the who's in the collaborative. So we have Medica UCare, Blue Cross, Health Partners, Prime West, South Country, IM Care, and Hennepin Health. Um, so you know, it's it's a group of us, and that we work together. We um, and so happy to have this webinar today um, with Molly Peterson um, from NAMI. So I'm going to move right into um, introducing Molly. Um, before I do that, though, um, I just want to. Uh, There'll be some polling questions um, that will pop up throughout the webinar, and we hope for um, your participation in that. But also, we will be monitoring the chat. Um, and so if you do have questions or comments or something, you know, go ahead and put, um, put those in the chat. Um, Patty Graham from Health Partners and myself will be monitoring that chat throughout. And then we'll kind of feed those questions to Molly um, kind of throughout the presentation. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll keep an eye on that um, for your questions. So just getting to the um, the presentation, um, our presenter is Molly Peterson. Um, she's a director of adult mental health programs for NAMI Minnesota. Um, NAMI is a nonprofit that provides education, support, and advocacy for those affected by mental illnesses. She leads a team of educators that are also boots on the ground. They're out there providing programs on mental illness, suicide prevention, community um, and workplace well-being, um, you know, as well as peer support groups. Interestingly, she previously worked as an epidemiologist um, with the Minnesota Department of Health, which is an interesting leap um, into the, the NAMI world. Um, as a health researcher on healthy eating and, and active li um, living. Um, so she, she kind of has um, a passion with health outcomes through public health programs um, rooted, a, rooted in data and health equity. So it fits right into the work that she's doing um, at uh, NAMI also. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Molly, um, and let you uh, take off and uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you for the introduction, Sheila. Um, thank you for having me here today. Thanks for letting me just take up a little bit of your space today and your time. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Um, so thank you to um, the collaborative that reached out and, and reached out to Nami and me to say this is something that they were interested in learning about. Um, a really cool topic. I enjoyed putting together today's presentation. Um, as Sheila said, my name is Molly. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I am the director of adult mental health programs at NAMI. Um, and I lead a team doing a lot of sort of robust programming throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, if you're not familiar with NAMI, um, we have been around for over 50 years. We 
formed with a group of mothers getting together at their kitchen table um, to advocate for state dollars to go to community and family programming after the closure of Hastings State Hospital. And so we are a boots on the ground grassroots organization who's just trying to work with as many individuals, families, and professionals who are impacted or serving individuals who are impacted by mental illnesses. Um, and so I know the work that each of you are doing is really boots on the ground as well. And I hope that there is something you pick up today um, in the presentation that will be helpful for the work that you do. So we're going to talk about over understanding and overcoming coming some of those unique barriers for people who have co-occurring diabetes and depression. Um, as Sheila mentioned, there's I love having um, sort of conversational or in, in more of an informal feel to my presentation. So instead of sort of waiting all the way to the end for questions, if I'm going to have a couple of polling opportunities that break up my talking, I also will probably get sick of talking for an hour and a half. So um, I really encourage you to ask questions, um, share stories, like what has worked for you? What have you um, had challenges with? Um, and then if you have questions, we'll address them as they come up. So uh, thank you in advance to the team helping put on the webinar today. So we have a couple different learning objectives that I'm gonna follow along with today. Uh, we're just gonna start by defining the challenges of co-occurring mental illness and diabetes. Um, talking about those and identifying those really confounding symptoms that come along with these two illnesses. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about how medication can make things a little more confusing and even ex exacerbate some of those uh, co-occurring symptoms. Then we'll dive into some of those strategies to engage patients and their families in care. Um, when I refer to family today, I'm referring to the most wide um, definition of the word, chosen family, um, blended families, um, however people want to ide uh, identify and define family today, we'll be talking about families later on. And then what are some resources that you can kind of just have in your back pocket to support patients, whether that's the tips that we're going to go over as we articulate those strategies, or if it's just like a physical um, resource for one of the things that you can refer someone to. So let's get started with understanding mental illnesses. Um, I know that everybody here has a diverse background and knowledge of a lot of the different information I'm going to talk about today. So for some of you, this may be review. Um, for some of you, this may be the first time you're hearing about it, but I'm going to start, um, I'm going to talk about it as if all of us are new to this, because um, I love having any chance to educate people on mental illnesses and the way that they're different from mental health. Um, so I'll talk about a little bit of the statistics of mental illnesses, but most specifically depression, but um, mental illnesses impact one in five US adults. So these are common. And although you may not be one of those people who lives with a mental illness, we all have mental health. And so I often talk to people who they're, you know, why'd you attend this class? Why'd you attend this program? What, you know, what was it that brought you here? And they're like, I know people who have mental health. And I'm like, you have mental health. <laughs> um, we all have mental health. We may not be um, living with the symptoms of a specific mental illness, but everybody is impacted by mental health. And so that is just the state of our mental well-being that allows us to cope with stress, to show up in our communities, our workspaces, um, realize our abilities, contribute to society. That is our mental well-being. Um, Mental, mental, mental illnesses really sort of disrupt that. Um, they affect our thinking, our moods, our feelings, and the way that we're able to interact and have relationships with others and the settings and environments around us. Um, they are medical illnesses, and um, we just see the manifestation of mental illnesses as behaviors, feelings, thoughts, um, and sometimes physical. We'll, we'll see physical symptoms, um, and mental illnesses are absolutely treatable. So I love showing this sort of like graph um, that the Minnesota Public Health Mental Wellbeing Advisory came up with several years back because I just think it's such a beautiful way to explain how mental health and mental illness intersects and in, in a way that I don't think we all realize or think about. So there's four quadrants on this graph. Um, the left or yeah, left to right, you're going to see that we're in a, an area of severe mental illness to no mental illness. And then from top to bottom, we're going from good mental health to poor mental health. And these four quadrants represent different sort of realities for people. And 
what I love about mental health and mental illness is like it changes all the time. Um, and that's just a, such a good place to start in terms of like everything we're going to talk about today. Every day is different and there is no one size fits all approach to treating somebody with a mental illness like depression. Um, so in, in the first quadrant, that's somebody who has good mental health, but no mental illness. Um, you may see yourself in one of these quadrants today or tomorrow, um, a year ago, but this is somebody who's flourishing. Um, they have really good relationships. They um, are they have a good self-care routine. Um, they feel that they're engaged in the work they're doing, or you know, they're they at least can show up to work and do the work and be productive um, and get something out of it. You know, they have activities that they enjoy. They um, have a good peer support and good connections around them. So they're just really flourishing. Um, somebody in the second quadrant doesn't have a mental illness, but may have poor mental health. And so this may be somebody who just situationally is going through something really hard at the time um, and is, is feeling maybe disempowered. They're feeling socially isolated. Um, hopeless, you know, they may have lost a job, they they may be grieving a loss, um, they may be experiencing unemployment or, or no housing. Um, and so they may not have a diagnosed mental illness, but they're currently um, struggling. And so we call this languishing. Um, in the third quadrant, we would have somebody who has severe mental illness um, and poor mental health, and this is somebody in crisis. So this is somebody that could really use some support from their care team, case managers, um, people in their life. And then lastly, um, for somebody who has severe mental illness, but good mental health, this is someone we refer to as in recovery. And we're gonna talk about what recovery looks like later on. So what is depression? We're gonna focus on depression today. A lot of what I talk about in terms of just like broadly mental health and treatment related to mental health and recovery um, for mental illnesses, um, I'm going to try and focus mostly on depression, but many of these things are, are themes across mental illness diagnoses. So depression is a common um, but serious um, mood disorder. About 8% of U.S. adults, which is about 25 million U.S. adults, um, experience a major episode of depression each year. Um, in youth, it's about 15% of, of youth, which is about 4 million youth in, um, in the States. So it's, it's not uncommon. And you'll come across people who have are currently experiencing symptoms of depression or have been touched by it by someone in their life, or maybe they had a previous episode in the past and now they're doing really well in recovery. Um, so it's it's not novel. Um, there's a lot of different types of depression. So major depression is the one people are usually, when, when you just hear depression, you're often thinking about major depression. Um, there is depression associated with um, the, the whole spectrum of perinatal, um, that perinatal period in someone's life. Um, so that can be a very new onset of something and, and really something to think about later on as we're talking about diabetes and perinatal diabetes. Um, seasonal defect, affective disorder is a, a really sort of situational depression, but for folks who experience seasonal affective disorder, it's something that they're experiencing usually every year. Um, so it is, again, that chronic persistent um, illness in their life. Um, dysthymia is a, a little more rare, but this is more of a persistent depressive disorder. So instead of sort of experiencing like episodes of depression, um, even if it's like those reoccurring um, periods of, of depression in between times of recovery, this person tends to experience a more intense, persistent um, depressive order, disorder across their life. And then we will see people who have depression that also experience symptoms of psychosis. Depression can be caused by a lot of things. Um, biology and genetics are certainly um, are, are certainly a, a big component. So for individuals who live with mental illness, there's often a history of mental illnesses in the family. Um, and then also just, you know, sort of things that those body functions that change over our lifespan, they may become risk factors for depression. So we'll talk about, you know, later I have a couple um, bullets down co-occurring illnesses um, can really change the, the functions of the body enough that someone can develop uh, depression. Cognitions is an interesting one, but there's good data that suggests that people who are sort of like predisposed or have like um, chronic negative attitudes towards life, that can be a risk factor for developing depression. Um, so somebody who just tends to have a more negative outlook on life that can eventually um, create changes in the body and in the brain um, to the point that someone develops depression. Uh, traumatic experiences are 
are definitely a risk factor for developing depression, whether that is um, a developmental trauma from when someone was growing up as a child or they experienced um, a, an acute sort of traumatic experience like a car accident, a, a loss, um, sexual violence, racial violence, um, discrimination. There's a lot of um, traumatic experiences that can eventually turn into depression if that person isn't met with the right treatment and support at the time. Medications, we'll talk about medications and side effects of medications and then life situations. So I kind of mentioned a little bit of them in the, um, while well, talking about trauma, but there's lots of life situations that can um, become a risk factor for depression. Again, if that person isn't receiving the support they need at the time. Um, and we're gonna talk about how, um, especially with life situations, um, it's normally like people are kind of thinking that it's sort of situational and it'll go away. Um, and so we'll talk about that a little bit. So I tried to focus on some of the symptoms that are more um, like tied to somebody who is also living with diabetes and, and how this is going to be confusing and confounding later on. Um, there is a, a wide variety of symptoms with depression. And again, there's no one size fits all diagnoses for, di uh, for depression. Um, and there's no like normal for depression. Um, so I tried to focus on a few in terms of the body people are going to feel you know, they could feel headaches, they could feel pains throughout their body. It's really common that we see um, fatigue um, and sort of low energy levels um, in people with depression. They're often sleeping too much or they may even be sleeping too little. So then overall, they're just sort of energy levels are, are down, their circadian rhythms and their metabolism is altered. Um, and then we may see changes in, in appetite. Uh, some thoughts and feelings. Um, which are really, again, just a really big part of having a, a mental illness. People feel inadequate. Um, they often feel guilty. Um, they can be irritable or even like forgetful. Um, they may, they definitely feel lonely um, a lot of the time. Um, in depression, it's not uncommon to experience thoughts of death or suicide. And um, people may be, in addition to like that forgetfulness, they may just be unable to concentrate or focus. So they may have a hard time working on activities for a long period of time. Um, and then, you know, being motivated is hard because they lack energy. Um, so, you know, decision fatigue is really, is really real for um, people who have these symptoms. Behaviors, they can become withdrawn. So they are suddenly not interested in doing the things they used to want to do or talking on the phone or going out to dinner with a friend or, you know, maybe they're in a, an activity and they don't want to go anymore. Um, so they're really starting to withdraw. Um, they may have a hard time starting or finishing tasks. And again, like having an inability to focus or feeling unmotivated, those things just really go hand in hand. Um, not keeping up with their responsibilities um, or just feeling like this sort of sense of restlessness, um, especially for folks who aren't sleeping well. So, so many of these symptoms manifest um, kind of together and separately at the same time, and they can tend to kind of feed off of each other, um, which can be really important when we go into some of the strategies later on. So this is what people with depression say this feels like. I took this from Mental Health America. Um, People might say that they feel like they're a burden to everyone, um, that they're exhausted, um, that they're that they're hopeless. Um, they feel misunderstood and ashamed. Um, they feel like no one sees them um, and their and their struggles, and they feel like they may never be happy again. Um, so this is really real. And I, what I want to hear from you is like, how have you had clients, or maybe you want to talk about somebody in your personal life? How would you? How have you heard them describe their experience with? Um, depression um, specifically, but you, because we're talking about depression and in diabetes, if there's patients you're working with, how have you heard them describe their experiences? How are they talking about the way they feel? And you should have a like poll slash quiz box that pops up. Um, and there's like a ability to like enter your your um, kind of short answer. And if you don't see that, you can also put your answer into the chat box. That's just fine too. Yeah, loneliness and tired.
Give it a little more time. You're not wanting to do things anymore. Seeing a few in the chat. In general, whenever there's like a good response, um, feel free to close the poll and I'll go through some other responses. Mm. Yeah, it looks like we have about 132 responses. So if right. we want to keep going and and I can keep the poll up or I can close the poll as well. Yeah, I think you can post the poll and we'll go through um, okay. we'll a few of them. Um, in the chat, I see um, someone said, I can't eat. We're just going to be there. Um, so I don't want to be rude and not eat. Um, so maybe it prevents them from going. And if, if that's your personal story, thank you for sharing. Um, it can be really hard to um, share. Um, that's a that's definitely a very good one is how some of those symptoms, um, the way they manifest, then they, it kind of starts this spiral um of action that enables us to withdraw or or you know creates other um symptoms to suddenly manifest um they kind of like i said feed off of each other and then can i can i see the results to the poll yeah it looks like if you click on view details it'll pop up otherwise we have um becomes forgetful yeah depression yeah, depression hinders their motivation, feel unmotivated and alone, withdrawn, feeling okay. stuck, yeah. ER visits to assess diabetes, mental health, hospitalizations due to increased depression. Yeah. Uh, when one is bad, the other is too. Depression makes managing my diabetes hard and diabetes makes my depression worse. Mm -hmm. They don't even want to take medications because they feel very sad. Yeah. They're on a constant roller coaster. They have fatigue and not wanting to do things, which impacted managing diabetes. Um, I just feel like I'm watching. I feel like I'm lost. I feel like I'm watching my life move so fast. It feels like I'm getting left behind. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Overwhelming. Yeah. Good. Thank you, um, Jenna, for reading. Bye yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for those of you who participated in the poll. Um, it sounds like several people kind of shared their own personal journey with diabetes and depression or one of the two. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, it is it is really hard. The, the loneliness and the isolation is, is really real. Um, the motivation to do, we're going to talk a lot about self-care later and the challenges of self-care, um, how some of these symptoms really make it hard to manage those day-to-day -day self-directed medical activities um, because it's just fatiguing and you do see the world around you kind of moving forward and feeling like you're not a part of it, um, feeling like you can't go to dinner because there's um, things that you can't eat and not feeling like there's some awareness or support around you. Um, it really makes you just want to retreat and withdraw even more. So um, I want to just like recognize all of the things that were shared and, and thank you all for um, sharing. Um, so, you know, move on to, you know, talking about kind of the impacts of depression. Depression is never normal. Um, I mentioned earlier when we were talking about um, causes of depression, life situations, people often think that like um, situational sadness as a result of something that happened is, is just, I'm sad. Um, but it really may be depression. And what keeps us from having those, taking those things seriously, seeking treatment, um, seeking support is feeling like, I'll just get over this. It's, it's really just a situational response. It's really just situational sadness. Um, it's very normal to be sad. If you lose a job, it's very normal to be sad if a friend moves away. Um, but if it's persistent, um, enough that it's no longer just 
sadness. Um, it may be depression and it may require treatment. It may require care from a care team um, and care coordinators and case managers who have relationships with these people can really help them kind of recognize that um, and move out of the, there's just so much, you know, sort of negative attitudes about depression that it really keeps us from acknowledging it for what it is um, and, and not feeling like it's just, oh, I'll take care of it on my own. Like, it'll go away. Um, I don't need medical care for this um, because depression can affect everybody. Um, it doesn't discriminate based on age, um, gender, race, ethnicity, socio socioeconomics. It, it can affect anybody at any time for a variety of reasons. Um, and so we want to take it seriously. We want people in our lives to take it seriously um, because especially if you're living with other medical conditions, it can really complicate those. And so we we want people to seek treatment. Um, unfortunately, I have on, you know, I have on my slide that only about a third of people experiencing serious depression will seek treatment. And oftentimes it's like negative public attitudes, it's reluctancy, it's fear, it's the idea that this will just go away that really keeps people from seeking treatment. Um, for people who do have depression, there's just a lot of risk factors for physical illness. And we were mentioning how some of those um, symptoms of depression are going to put them at risk for chronic health conditions. And that could be weight gain, um, maybe even obesity, lack of energy, um, or just like a really bad sleep routine um, or self-care. So beyond just people think self-care, and, and I'm going to use that word a lot later on, um, we're not just talking like pedicures and face masks, or, um, you know, vitamin D, we're talking like taking your medications at the right time. Um, if you have like a CGM, making sure you're, you're, you're cleaning and checking and moving your ports and um, cleanliness and keeping and making appointments, those are things are all self-care um, and, and people um, with depression are going to be at risk of more chronic health conditions because they're not performing that self-care. Um, they may also experience an increased appetite. And if they're doing medical treatment to treat their depression, they may suddenly see that they really have an increased appetite and their appetite is suddenly for um, specific foods, um, maybe foods that are not in line with their treatment plan, maybe foods that are just easier, like they're hungry. So they just sort of grab and go the, the couple things and maybe those aren't the most nutritious, nutritious um, because of that lack of energy there, or maybe that poor sleep cycle, they're suddenly experiencing more tiredness than usual. Um, so these symptoms are going to be exacerbated by um, medications that they're taking. Um, there is so much data out there and so much research and articles about the sort of bi-directional relationship of, um, of, of physical health conditions and depression, um, especially those um, metabolic diseases and cardiovascular disease. Um, so I won't, I won't read all of these, but there's just so much data that says these two are related and it's because there's a lot of similar symptoms and they kind of feed off each other. Um, and, and a lot of the challenges are, are they're there and they're hard to overcome. Um, but people with depression, we're talking about diabetes today, so I'll just say 60% more likely to develop diabetes than the general population. Um, and there's also a statistic on here about obesity. Um, again, just a lot of confounding reasons for why these, these two, um, mental illness and physical illness, kind of go hand in hand. The burden of depression, though, when someone does also have a physical health condition, that burden of having depression um, really is higher than somebody who has one of these physical health conditions but doesn't have depression. So disease-specific symptoms. Um, so if someone has depression and diabetes, they're gonna they may experience a higher um, burden of symptoms related to diabetes. Um, somebody may also experience uh, worse social and vocational impairment. So that withdrawal from social activities, um, the lack of motivation may make it really hard for them to show up at work and be productive every day, to feel engaged in the work they're doing and excited. Um, and then there's lots of data about how um, patients, of course, with diabetes have higher direct and indirect healthcare costs, but it's even worse so when that person is also experiencing depression. So they're experiencing quite um higher healthcare costs than their um, than the general population. Unfortunately, depression is associated with lower rates of adherence to treatment and self-care plans. Um, kind of alluded to a lot of this already, and we're gonna dive in more, but if you're just thinking about medication, someone said that in um, 
in the poll a little bit ago, taking medication every day, that can be really hard. Um, showing up for lab appointments or doing your glucose monitoring at home, um, sticking to a, a physical activity um, component of a treatment plan or getting in your proper nutrition that you need for both. Um, these are tools not only for diabetes, but they're tools for depression recovery too. And so these things can be really hard because they're self-directed. Um, and then medication, I'll mention again, there's a lot of medications that treat both diabetes, um, uh, sort of effects of diabetes, other metabolic diseases, um, depression, of, of course, um, that are going to change how the body is physio physiologically sending signals um, that are going to manage a lot of the things that are really key to managing diabetes, such as appetite, energy, food cravings. Um, they're also really affecting functions of the body that regulate our energy, they respond to inflammation, they manage hormones. And all of these things are really important when it comes to um, preventing or managing, especially type two diabetes, but diabetes in general. Um, so again, just seeing how these things really layer to create a, a really big burden of care for these individuals. So I'll kind of um, summarize that by saying between symptoms of depression, between symptoms of diabetes, and between um, the, the side effects of medication, it's gonna be really hard for both the individual and their care team to discern where a, a new symptom is possibly coming from. If, if they're experiencing lack of energy, is it because this is a new depression diagnosis? Um, did they just start a new medication? Um, is this a new symptom and we're not really sure why it suddenly manifested? Um, has there been changes in their treatment plan? Have they started maybe not um, following a specific part of that treatment plan um, because their symptoms are worse all of a sudden. There's a lot of um, a lot of really co confusion around these symptoms and, and where they're coming from. And it's gonna be really important to that individual and care team to work together to figure out how they can best um, change a treatment plan, change medication, address the symptoms. So I wanna pause um, and we'll do a poll again or you can write in the chat, what resonates so far? Um, does anything surprise you? Again, this may be new or maybe review, but is there anything so far that you're like, oh yeah, that has absolutely been part of a conversation I've had with a client or a patient or yourself, family member, a friend, um, or anything in here is that you're like, oh wow, I didn't think about it that way. Um, I would love to hear. We give folks a couple more minutes. And then Jenna, when you see that there's been a good number of responses, we can close the poll again. Looks like we're at about 54 people responded. Great. And I'm not seeing anything in the in the chat to read or anything. Um, maybe give folks one more minute and then we can give close the poll and share some feedback.
Right. So our poll is closed. Mm -hmm. um, Jenna, I don't have a, like a link to view the responses. So if you don't mind reading them again, that would be great. Sure. Yeah, 70% of people with a mental illness also have a chronic health condition. Mm -hmm. This information brings light to things that we know, but maybe don't always consider or think about mm -hmm. the aspects of depression and how, Im how it impacts their diabetes. Uh, the term non-compliance is used so much when it comes to patients with diabetes. Mm -hmm. I can relate to hearing how depression symptoms and diabetes overlap, and it's really important to differentiate between the two for treatment. Mm -hmm. That physical and mental health absolutely go hand in hand. Um, the common nature. I was surprised at the higher risk for DMII with those diagnosed with depression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Having dia uh, having diabetes is a lot of work, and that alone can be depressing. Mm -hmm. Interesting to hear how depression presents so differently so differently in each individual. Mm -hmm. I was surprised to learn that people with depression are more likely to get diabetes, and I've seen quite a lot of no surprises yeah. as well. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing. Yes, the the some of the statistics are pretty staggering so when you to hear that um 70 percent of of people with a mental illness also have a physical health condition it's like wow um those symptoms really put them at risk for for other illnesses and um it just is and it's so hard for somebody who's experiencing some of those symptoms of depression um to take care of themselves to go to the doctor to follow a treatment plan, to do a lot of really self-directed activities. So um, thank you for participating. Thank you for sharing. And if, yeah, none of this was surprising, you know, you're, you're, you've seen this a lot. Um, I'm glad that it at least is resonating and feeling accurate. Um, so I want to talk about treatment and recovery. And this is really um, specific to the depression side of today's conversation. Um, if somebody is going to be pursuing treatment, there's a couple of really important things that are, are part of that. And it's that the person is involved in their care. Um, that is a really hard, it can be really hard to overcome. Um, and we'll talk about like sort of setbacks and stuff later on. Um, but having a, an individual really invested in their treatment plan is, is a critical element. And this may sound like an oversimplification, but an effective treatment plan that works is really important. And because there's that sort of no one size fits all or that um, there are a variety of symptoms and manifestations of the same symptoms in different people, having a, a go-to treatment plan for your patients that have depression and diabetes, being aware and flexible that it might not work um, or that it might change over time and having the patient and those providers, those care coordinators, those case managers, that everybody is is okay with that, that everybody understands the reality and that is willing to be flexible and try new things. Um, if finding it a treatment plan that works can be really hard, but it's a really important element of recovery and treatment for people with, with depression. And recovery is um, really beautiful. And for an individual with mental illness, they they get the back a lot of those aspects of their life that go away because of the symptoms of depression. So we were talking about withdrawal, um, lack of interest, suddenly not wanting to do things they used to love, um, feeling like they don't have a maybe even a purpose or they they don't have this sense of connection and belonging. Um, someone had you know mentioned feeling really stuck or feeling like the world is going by without them being a part of it. Um, participation in something meaningful is really important to someone's recovery, and so. What is that? Is it getting back into an activity they once loved that they've stopped? Um, is it feeling re-energized at work, engaged, um, feeling like they're a good team member, a good thought partner, um, feeling proud of some of the work they're doing? Maybe they're doing a project at home and they feel really good about it. Um, I have wonderful colleagues um, who live with depression and have team members who live with depression. And, um, you know, <laughs> I have an individual who um, has told me time and time again how much she wants to spend the weekend painting, finishing painting a room in her house that she has had sitting there unfinished for years. And she lives with depression. And she's like, it is so hard to spend my free time doing a task, even though it's something I want to do. Um, and I'll never forget, like several months ago, we've worked together for years. Um, she came to me and said she painted that wall that weekend. And she felt so like, 
the whole week. I, she was just like, I felt like it was impacting and rippling throughout the rest of her week. Um, it's just like never underestimate the power of some of those really small changes in someone's life, especially when it comes to regaining purpose, um, meaning in their life. Um, having a safe home environment is also really important. Um, and this can look like a lot of different things. It might be like psychological safety. Someone may feel like they have um, really had, had strained relationships at home because of how their depression is showing up in their day-to-day -day life, um, not being able to be engaged, maybe not feeling like they want to go and sit at the dinner table with their family. Um, I personally grew up with a mother who lived with depression and um, it was really hard in the home. It's really hard on the family. And so having a safe home environment is going to be really crucial to recovery. Um, again, that might be chosen family and maybe roommates and maybe um, a, a guardian, whoever it is at home needs to make sure that they're working with that individual to achieve a home environment that feels safe for everybody. And then meaningful relationships. I kind of covered the, that in the two of these, but we'll talk about the importance of peer support, um, having allies, having um, members of your care team that you trust um, and that they can empathize with. Those relationships are really important to somebody who's um, coming into a time of recovery. So recovery is difficult. It's gonna, it, it, it can be um, and often is difficult, but it is possible to um, experience recovery with a mental illness. So um, treatment is gonna take time. It's gonna take work from all involved. So that's everyone on this call. It's families and friends, it's teachers, it's, it's everybody who's touching the life of that person. It's gonna um, take time. Medication may be a part of their treatment plan. It may not be. Um, and if it is, it's only one part often. Um, effective treatment plans for depression are, are often including and, and, and should include a good care team, um, a team that is really working together holistically to treat um, both the depression, the, the, the diabetes, knowing that they are individual illnesses themselves, but the fact that they often um, uh, compound each other. Therapy and support is really important. Um, self-care routines and um, in all of the ways that self-care um, refers and then connection to others. So let's talk about barriers to care. These are some of the ones that I've come up with, um, but I know that there's probably a lot of other ones out there. Uh, we could probably spend like a whole section on just this. Um, so I, I am, I'm, you know, if we didn't do an official poll for this, but if there's others you've experienced and you want to throw them in the chat, please feel free um, and I'll read them. Um, adherence to treatment plans. I, someone even said um, that non-compliance is very commonly used when working with patients with diabetes. Um, yeah, adherence to treatment plans um, for both diabetes and depression is really common. And also those self-care routines at home, that self-directed medical care in between. Um, appointment attendance and follow-up appointments, whether they're making those appointments on their own or they're just having to show up and then show up again. Um, those misconceptions and those kind of confusing symptoms can be barriers to their care because if we're not really communicating and discerning what's going on, um, there's going to be a, a lot of miscommunication and, and possible mistreatment in their plan. So as I mentioned the self-directed medical care um, and then the potential lack of support systems or caregivers outside of their you know, medical care team. Um, someone mentioned in the chat the cultural pressure, pressure to not seek treatment. And that is so real. Thank you for sharing that. Um, there is a lot of um, stigma, negative attitudes, discrimination. Again, that really goes back to what I was talking about earlier, where it's like, you'll get over it. You don't need care. This isn't real. Um, that we don't take depression seriously. Um, those are really real. And in some um, cultural communities, it's that's even high, it's even more prevalent. Um, so there is a lot of pressure to, to not do that. And, and socioeconomics is very real. Um, people financially may not be able to attend appointments. They may not have the transportation. Um, they may not have childcare. They may be more worried about the food they're gonna put on the table that day. Um, treatment plans that have a lot of like recommendations for go to the gym. They're like, well, I can't go to the gym. Um, some of those socioeconomic factors are really big barriers to care. So thank you for calling that one out. Lack of resources. Language barriers, yes. Um, cultural responsiveness, 
on care teams is is very much lacking in Minnesota. Um, finding a provider who looks like you, who speaks the same language, who understands your background, um, who understands some of those cultural um, pressures or those um, sort of just like cultural norms and, and understands your story and your journey. Uh, we're lacking that in Minnesota. Um, there's a lot of communities that don't have access to a culturally informed or responsive provider. So big barrier to care is, is finding a care team that works for you, um, that works with you, that understands you. Um, lack of staff and resources at clinics, Yes, um, yes, there's definitely that piece on the of, on, on the provider side, the professional side of not having what they need um, to provide the care that they would like to provide. Um, everyone's in a hurry. Yep. Yeah, it's a really sort of unfortunate narrative of some of the um, some of the healthcare systems we have in place. Um, culturally, movies, TVs, books, people are led to believe diabetes is tied to sugary foods. Yes. And there's just as much of misinformation and stigma and discrimination about mental illnesses exists. Um, it's very much true for folks with diabetes. I have um, many folks in my family who live with diabetes and um, they are, they get very upset about like the someone, you know, eating candy and being told that they're going to get diabetes. Um, those like that unsafe language in our, in our culture and in pop culture especially, can really pe keep people from taking these illnesses seriously, seeking care, and not just brushing it off and acting like they're weak or they can solve it themselves. Um, it really provides a, a big barrier to care. Yeah, and it's just like poor education about these topics. Yeah, yeah, and language barrier for education. Yeah, health literacy, big issues. We don't have, always have all of the, um, you know, we can go and, and translate documents, but does it culturally land well with um, with somebody, you know, the, the meanings may, may not be the same or the recommendations may not be culturally informed. Um, so yeah, we need to find providers and case managers and care coordinators that really understand the, the needs of their patient, um, the culture of their patient, because many of these um, barriers we talked about have been really tied to culture. So thank you for sharing and shouting all of those out. Like, Beautiful responses. Um, I really appreciate it. Like I said, I feel like we could spend probably the whole session today just talking about barriers to care, um, which is probably unfortunate to say. Um, so let's talk about overcoming those barriers. Let's, uh, I'll try it and um, make, make some um, hopeful strategies for these. And again, these are not all inclusive. They're not. They're just some that I know, you know, knowing and working with folks who live with depression, especially because that is really the lens of this presentation today. I really wanted to focus on overcoming the barriers as uh, of, of treating both of these illnesses, but especially because of depression. Um, so these are the ones we're going to talk about today. Um, and again, at the end, if you have success stories or tips for your colleagues, like I would love to, we'll, we'll have a poll at the end. So we can do a little bit of discussion there. We're gonna address self-care challenges. Um, we're gonna talk about empowering uh, patients and um, helping them become their own medical self-advocate. We will talk about prioritizing safety and trust, um, encouraging family engagement and peer support. Um, and remember I said, you know, family in the broadest sense of the word, um, engaging loved ones is sort of part of that, um, encouraging engagement, building confidence and self-efficacy, um, and validating and celebrating. So let's start by talking about self-care. I've talked and alluded to this quite a bit so far. Um, the treatment plans for both diabetes and depression, each individually and then together, require a lot of self-care and sort of burden on the patient themselves. Um, they have to, you know, they're, they're monitoring their glucose, they're changing their sites, they're watching their numbers, um, and then they're doing physical activity, they're trying to get their walk in, they're trying to stretch, they're trying to make sure they go to sleep and that they can actually get the amount of sleep that they need. Um, they're trying to shower. There's many days that I run out of the house um, as somebody who's, who's has, I would say in this part of my life, good mental health um, and feels like they're resourced and has meaningful relationships and all of that. And I don't brush my teeth. Like I'll, I'll just forget because there's a lot going on. Um, so Imagining all of those symptoms of somebody living with depression and diabetes, how the smallest things may feel really hard. Um, 
self-care is more than that nutrition and sleep and exercise, but it's also making and attending appointments. It's it's keeping good health records. It's writing down questions. It's clarifying things with your provider so that you heard them correctly. Um, those self-directed activities are going to be challenging, like I said, for reasons of fatigue, motivation, forgetfulness, um, the ability to concentrate, um, shame and guilt. Those things all make it really hard to make appointments on our own. Picking up the phone and waiting on hold to make an appointment um, might be really difficult. Or maybe you're leaving a voicemail um, and you're like, ah, uh, I don't know. Do you think they'll call me back? And so you just like hang up and don't leave a voicemail. Um, and then afterwards, you start sort of like a, this sort of cycle of shame about, I can't believe I just hung up and I didn't leave a message. Do I call them back? Is that weird? Like to have multiple messages on their on their phone. Um, so making appointments on can that's something so simple, but it can feel like a big hurdle. Um, being the communicator between providers, like if you have a care team that isn't communicating between themselves well that this individual feels like no they they had told me this and now you're saying this but I didn't hear that um that person can start sort of questioning whether they're um whether they are hearing things correctly whether they wrote something down wrong that can make them that can really um make them feel hopeless or frustrated irritable um that can be really hard so the the communication between the providers and then keeping health records, um, that can just feel really hard because it just requires a lot of paying attention and a lot of sort of writing stuff down and um, really staying on top of something instead of being, that's a much more like preventive activity instead of a reactive one. And Molly, I just wanted to interject on this slide yeah. a little bit. It, what popped up for me is this is where care coordinators, this is kind of where you can really do some stuff for members um, to help kind of, you know, make sure that for example, on the self-care, you know, this would be an opportunity, for example, be really schooled on what the health plans um, supplemental benefits are, whether it's because I know a lot of the sub benefits are, you know, food benefits, free food, um, nutritious food, healthy savings cards, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, those kinds of things, the free gym memberships that are offered, the transportation to the gym, to and from the gym, transportation to and from the grocery store. Some of those benefits members, um, they just don't know about, you know, the health plans can send brochures and they can send annual information. But as a care coordinator, um, it's really a gift you can give them, you know, to, to remove some of those barriers by saying, hey, you get free transportation um, yeah. to the grocery store because you're you know, you're a Medica member or you're a health partners member or whatever. Um, so just just wanted to kind of put that in there a little bit um, that that you, you can be really powerful for that person, helping them with their self-care by making sure that they take advantage of some of the benefits that they do have. Yeah, thank you, Sheila. That's a huge call out. And that's something that is beyond my expertise. So I'm so glad that you jumped in and, and talked about that um, because I know it's a little bit different um, across the state and depends on what people are experiencing, what benefits they're going to be needing. But yeah, no, having a really good idea of how to help them problem solve um, or get over those barriers that they're facing, if it's something that they also have a benefit for, educating them. Um, that's we'll talk. We're going to talk about empowerment. That's a that's a really empowering thing for them to to know about and to get involved in their care. Um, this is like kind of semi-related, but we often talk about EAP programs with employers who want to know how to support their employees' mental health. Um, so those um, employee assistance programs, which are a wonderful benefit if a provider or if a um, organizing organization is offering their employees um, that EAP, like it's one of their benefits. And we see EAP um, usage rates at 3%, very low. And so we can share those brochures um, tell people about it or just, you know, throw it up on some type of internal um, news net and remind them. But until they like are really educated on here's all the things that this offer, like this, this benefit can do for you um, on a, in a really pragmatic way. Um, it, it can be the uptake of those things can be hard and they're there. Those like benefits are there. So I'm encouraging people to use them. 
when certain issues come up. Um, it's like, this is a good time to use that. That can be really helpful. So thank you, Sheila. Um, so here's how providers can kind of help with that, that list of things. And these are just examples. So I know this varies like case by case and you may be like, that doesn't happen. Or um, So these are just some examples. And I actually took some of these from like my own personal life as somebody who goes to goes to therapy and um, goes to the doctor and, and I live with a mental illness. So um, making follow-up appointments in the clinic. <laughs> I can tell you, I go to therapy once a week. And when I go, my therapist like walks me to the front desk and she says, I want to see Molly once a week. Can you make appointments for her for the next three months? And I leave with a list of printed out um, appointments that I have for the next three months. So I don't have to do anything. And if that were not the case, my my schedule, my routine of going to therapy would be vastly different because making those calls to schedule those appointments is really hard. Um, taking payments in the clinic instead of billing later. Um, I listed this one, um, and I know it might not be the case for everybody, but if someone has like a copay um, or they're paying for a, a lab or a medication directly, um, doing that in the clinic might um, really sort of relieve some of that guilt and um, anxiety that someone may feel of like receiving a bill later or going into their um, electronic chart and like seeing that they have a bill. Um, those can add up quick and then folks can that can really sort of activate that sort of shame and guilt and even prevent them from making future appointments, knowing that there's going to be additional bills associated with going back to the um, back to a provider. So um, taking those like right at the time can be if it's if it's appropriate. Um, another thing that just sort of eases that burden um, Providing summaries of appointments. I love when my providers give me um, printed out um, summaries of my appointments, and I will like use those during the appointment to take notes. Um, and then when you go home, that person can write. You know, if there's a specific instruction, they can be taking notes related to that instruction all in one place. It can really help with them maintaining those health records, um, ensuring good communication across the care team. It, kind of uh, easing that burden of being that middleman communicator between members of a care team um, by making sure the care team is communicating well, that can also really just not put the um, that person in that position. Giving really simple instructions, keeping your messaging simple, um, making, you know, there's there's so much jargon in the health world and um, like you, and someone in our, our chat had said, everybody's in a hurry, um, but keeping things really simple accessible um, so that that person isn't going home and again questioning that they misheard something in an appointment that they didn't understand it but that they were too afraid to ask or clarify um, those things can all be really helpful in terms of communication um, medical self-advocacy so we want to empower individuals to play an active role in their in their care and eventually maybe be the leader of their care team um, we were mentioning I mentioned earlier that in mental illness recovery, active involvement in their treatment is really important towards achieving recovery. So I think that you all can do this. It's going to take time because it, it takes those little successes and those little, you know, surmounting barrier moments to have that person start to feel like I can do this. I can be like an active member of my care team. I can lead my care team. I can advocate for myself. It takes time. Um, but what does that look like? So how, you know, what are small things that you can say, hey, this is, you know, something I see you getting involved in. Um, they should be really informed about their conditions and their treatment options. So education is really important. Um, don't just assume that people know. Um, I And I love to just tell people like, hey, I may be telling you something you already know. Um, so I'm not meaning to offend you or disregard any knowledge you have. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. So here, you know, here's what this is and, and kind of really explaining stuff. Um, helping, you know, organize their appointments, arriving prepared. So having those questions ready and saying, hey, last time you said something about this and I went home and I was kind of confused and I want to make sure that I'm doing this right. Um, those can be some things that they can come prepared with to their appointments. Um, communicating with their care team, so answering phone calls. Um, sometimes answering a phone call from a case a case manager or, or one of their coordinators might be like, I just am really not feeling like talking to somebody. But really communicating with their care team is part of being an advocate for their own health. 
managing their treatment and self-care. We talked a little bit about that already. There's so much we could, again, spend like a whole topic on just managing self-care routines, um, but being a part of managing their treatment and self-care, um, doing their best to um, achieve a lot of the components in their treatment plan. Um, that is medical self-advocacy. Um, they should be mindful of the fact that a lot of the things they do can be preventive. And, and so moving from a reactive place to a preventive one so that you're sort of alleviating some of that like shame and guilt of being reactive. Um, if they're kind of getting ahead of it and they're learning about the importance of prevention, that can be really empowering. Um, mentioned per maintaining those personal health records and then them enlisting the support of others. Um, we talked about like safe home environments and I'm going to talk a lot about peer support. They have a, a role and the power to bring people on to their team that they want to be surrounded by. So um, friends, family, doctors, care team members, they have the option to enlist the people that they want to enlist. Um, this is actually like kind of like more advice for the individual themselves. So maybe this is something that um, if you're like, well, how can they be um, medical self advocates? We want to encourage them to just sort of like adopt this cooperation with their care team. Um, we what we want is we don't what we don't want is we don't want them to feel like this has been forced upon them. It's it's really sad and frustrating and unfortunate to receive a diagnosis of depression or diabetes, and that's that's already feeling like forced upon them. So having this like treatment team just like or treatment plan just like given to them and you know this is what you got to do um that doesn't feel like it's collectively built it doesn't feel like there's choice and autonomy um and so they can really get to this place of cooperation um with their care team by asking questions keeping everybody up to date on their symptoms and this is not all inclusive either this is not comprehensive just a, a few examples um keeping people up to date on symptoms so if they if they're suddenly you know, they're taking a new medication and suddenly they're noticing a new symptom, you know, instead of just sort of disregarding it, um, making sure that they're sharing that. That's really important. That's that's data. Um, sharing how well treatment or self-care routines are going um, or conversely sharing the concerns or challenges that they're experiencing with the with their treatment plan. Um, and then if there's any like lifestyle factors that have changed um, that could potentially impact their health, um, you know, they have even if it's just like a cold and they're on an antibiotic or, you know, or they're, they're going to be traveling. Um, if there's just some sort of like thing that comes up, um, but they're like, you know, this could really have an influence on my diet for the next week because I'm traveling. Um, those are just good things for people to keep um, their care team up to date on so that they can all be in communication about, you know, creative solutions, um, ways that they're going to solve for those um, together. And Molly, I do think about, yeah. Um, you know, such a good way. I think I'll, I, I use my chart or whatever the electronic mm -hmm. um, method is, the inroads. And I think a lot of people don't know how to do that. Um, yeah. You know, they don't know how to, that they have access to their appointment mm -hmm. information. They have access and some of, most of the um, apps also have a messaging system within yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So if you have a question about your appointment, hey, I, I did I hear this right? Mm -hmm. um, you can enter that in there. And usually it's going to be the assistant or the nurse or, or somebody who's, you know, going to read that. But I think that's, again, something that care coordinators can help mm -hmm. um, or case managers can help members see, you know, what, depending upon what system they're in, it could, yeah. you know, whether it's my chart or something else, but it's just, a way to empower them um, because with without having to pick up the phone, which is really hard for some people. Yep. Um, so I think just it's a great tool. And a lot of people, not everybody has a computer, but a lot of people do have a computer and a lot of people have smartphones. So yeah. um, just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, I love that. And if, you know, and if you have, I, I know it can take patience like over the phone if someone is like, can you walk me through this? Um, walk them through it and be empathetic and patient and understanding. Um, if this is something that they, if, if this isn't a tool they've used before, if they haven't sent a message to their provider through a MyChart before, or 
Um, they haven't, you know, found their upcoming appointments because maybe they're calling because they're like, I think I have an appointment next week. I'm not sure. Not only was it hard to make that call and just like admit that they didn't know something or that they may have forgotten something, um, but then having to go and dig for the answers themselves, you know, they called because you have established a relationship or they feel comfortable reaching out to you to ask for help. So, um, you know, validate them. Um, we're going to, we'll talk about that, but you know, if you're able to walk them through how to use some of those services and really just like be hip to hip with them, that can be really, um, empowering. Uh, so safety and trust is just huge. Um, and this is not something that is, you're not going to build it in a day. It's going to take a long time. It's going to take every single one of those individual interactions with them. The phone call where they're calling to say, I forgot if I have an appointment next week where you are validating them. You're listening with an empathetic ear. You're being patient. You're understanding um, what they may be going through. Um, that's making it hard for them to remember that appointment. Individuals are already feeling really reluctant to call to participate in their care. Um, they are blaming themselves for, they're saying that their illness is their fault, that they did something. Um, they're experiencing shame and guilt, that discrimination, negative attitudes about diabetes and depression, because there's discrimination for both of those. Um, they can keep individuals from being really honest about the things that are just like, that are concerning them. Um, or they may feel, they may feel silly asking questions. Um, so listen with an empathetic ear. It is a care team's responsibility to treat people. It is everybody's responsibility <laughs> to treat people with care and respect. Um, I thought that this was a nice quote. I, in my bio, I talked about how I love improving health outcomes through storytelling. It's a, it's a, just a, a big component of how we learn from people. Um, and I found this quote um, from a diabetes um, support group site where someone said that they probably would have had depression even if they didn't have diabetes, but that it's really complicated, the, the experience altogether. Um, the amount of daily decisions, someone had mentioned that earlier in one of our prompts about daily, the amount of decisions that you have to make on a day-to-day, -day. the stress, um, this person experienced bad doctors, the financial drain, um, you know, we mentioned the direct and indirect healthcare costs, uh, lack of support of people around them and that lack of understanding, they all just compound the issue. Um, and so you can just see how that would make it really hard for someone like this to um, feel like their treatment plan is going well, that managing their symptoms is going well, that achieving recovery is going well. So there are so many ways to promote safety and, and build trust. Again, highlighting just a few. If you are in a physical space with this individual, make sure it's a safe one. Um, again, this is why it's really important that folks get connected to somebody who maybe shares their their, their culture, um, their story. If someone expresses that they're uncomfortable with something, listen to them, take them seriously, um, and, and provide a space where someone even feels comfortable saying they're uncomfortable. <laughs> um, if it's, you know, having up um, signs, um, ask, maybe asking the question, questions directly, like, do you feel comfortable with this space or giving people a heads up about what they're going to experience while in the space together um, that can really promote some of that physical safety. Um, if you're on a phone with somebody um, or emailing, you can still create uh, safety. So uh, using really safe and respectful language, um, making sure we'll talk about communication next, but your tone, um, the way you're asking questions, uh, some questions, the way we ask them can be really leading. Like you're asking them, you're, you're wanting a specific answer and that person's going to feel like, am I answering this incorrectly? It's so just saying what you mean. Um, those things can really help with safety if you're not in a physical shared space with somebody. Um, and, and respectful language is really important with people with mental illness. Um, I could do a class on respectful language, um, but you know, not making sort of comments about um, that would just sound like discriminatory or they're based in stigma. Um, we often hear all sorts of words in just our everyday vernacular that are based in disability um, ableism. So if we say, oh man, the weather is so bipolar today, or, you know, that's crazy. Those are things that someone could be like, not kind of offended by. It. And so kind of keep an eye on your language use and use safe, respectful language and respect boundaries. Everybody has boundaries, whether they're emotional or physical, mental. Um, if you don't know someone's boundaries, 
again, that, that relationship over time, you might learn them. Um, if somebody feels like they're reluctant to do something specific, there's probably a reason why they're feeling reluctant. So if there's a boundary, um, be respectful of that. Um, you can build trust through shared decision-making. Let people be a part of the decisions that are being made. So if they're going to try a new medication, you could, you know, give them their options and say, instead of just saying, let's try this one, it's, you know, here's, here's kind of the information about them. Um, what do you think, you know, um, or if, if you're going to be referring them on to as, as, you know, as you're walking them through their benefits, you're going to be referring them on to a, a specific benefit, a specific resource, come to those decisions together, um, sending them to a new provider, help, let them be a part of the decision. And, and that'll really ensure like choice and autonomy, um, which can really help people feel empowered. Again, it doesn't feel like these things are being like thrust upon them. They get to be an active part. Uh, transparency is really important. Um, there is a lot of mistrust of just the medical system altogether, especially in certain in certain communities and cultures. So just know that um, and be transparent. Doing what you say you will is actually a very trauma-informed approach. Um, people who've experienced trauma, they may have a lot of mistrust in, like I said, the medical system, providers, um, certain like groups of people, like whatever it is, um, they may have some mistrust. And so saying you're going to do something and then following up on it, um, that can be that can really help build some trust. And being helpful, that always helps build trust. <laughs> Um, some effective tools for communication. Um, we teach effective communication with individuals that live with mental illness in some of our family classes at NAMI. And so we're working with caregivers to say, here's how you can really effectively communicate with your loved one who lives with depression, um, who's experiencing really hard symptoms right now. Um, and these are some of the tools that we teach them. Um, communicate with compassion and empathy, like hear them out, you know, understand that these, this is, these aren't symptoms that anybody wants to experience. They don't, people don't want to feel forgetful or unmotivated, um, disengaged. Um, they don't want to feel like I'm going to keep using someone else's word. They don't want to keep feeling like the world is moving on without them, or it's things are spinning without them um, being a part of it. So just communicate with compassion and empathy and understand that whatever their experience is, it is true for them. Um, it may not be your perception, but it is whatever their perception is, it is their reality. So just be empathetic to that. Use that clear, direct language. Say what you mean. Um, keep it simple. Um, use accessible language and options. Um, if you have a particular feeling about something or there's something you've observed, it's really important to use I statements so you're not feeling like you're um, telling them what, you know, the situation is you're saying, I have observed, you know, it's funny. I, you know, I thought more about this and here's what I have learned. Um, making it about you, about the things you feel that you've seen, that you've observed, um, can not make it feel like you're attacking that person. And then active listening, active listening means you're asking questions. You're, um, you're stating, I understand why that would be really hard. Um, we're just really being a part of the conversation and not just brushing off anything they're saying, moving on from the conversation too fast. Um, just being a really engaged and active listener by having good sort of follow-up statements that tell that person you're listening, that you're trying to understand. Um, those things can be really helpful in making somebody feel heard. So I put an example in here. It's maybe basic, <laughs> um, but I want to know how you would help in this situation or maybe like some of the things that come across your mind. Um, so Carla has major depression and she's struggled with managing her medication and diet. She was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes several years ago and she recently developed pain and swelling in her legs and feet. Um, she also experienced, um, she's also experiencing muscle stiffness and, and trouble with her gait and kind of walking. Um, she feels really frustrated by all of this, understandably. She's overwhelmed with like the day-to-day -day stress of these symptoms and just the reality of some new symptoms. And she worries about how she can keep her health from getting worse. Um, so just like, what are your some, what are some of your just like initial thoughts about how you might help? Um, maybe some of the questions you might ask, maybe some, um, yeah, just, just some thoughts. And we'll give this a, a few minutes um, and then move on. So I'm gonna make sure we get through the rest. I kind of wonder, Molly, if this one 
it, it would work better for everybody to just put their answers in the chat so that yeah. you can see them as they come up. Yeah, that's fine too. I, absolutely. So if you want to just, you know, either is fine, but um, I think for discussion purposes, it might be easier because then you can, we can all see everybody yeah. else's responses. Yeah, that'd be great. And yeah, and Jenna doesn't have to read them all. <laughs> yeah, so please just type in the chat and then I'll read them as they come through. Yeah, thank you. Just listening to her and then maybe setting up um, some time with a diabetes educator, care coordinator, so that um, she would have contact for anything that comes up. Great. A wellness coach, um, referring to a wellness coach, that'd be great. Asking uh, Carla when uh, she last saw her medical provider. That's a great one too. Um, offering home delivered meals that are diabetic friendly, um, providing some gym options, recommending physical therapy, um, bubble packs and medic for medications. That's great. I love those. Yeah. Um, ask her if, if she's keeping the appointments with her doctors. Is she taking any medications? Yeah, Cindy said that she would first say that sounds really hard. Um, that's, yes, that affirmation, that validation um, is really hard. It probably, it, it's probably going to take Carla um, some time to feel like she, you know, needs help, um, that she can't just do this on her own and that she needs to reach out. So first by saying, that sounds really hard. I'm so glad you reached out. I'm so glad you called. Um, that can be really, that can go a long way in making people feel um, that someone cares about them. Um, asking and asking what's the most important to Carla and how um, we can help. Great. Right? Reminding Carla to see her primary care provider or even offer to help make that appointment um, and repeating the symptoms back to her. That's that active listening. That's great. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Um, asking for a little more insight on what her days have been looking like. Yeah, when, when she last saw her primary care provider. Yeah, just asking some more questions to better understand the situation so that you can provide some really good answers and resources and next steps. Um, who's in Carla's network? Yeah, so maybe that you can refer them, um, refer Carla on for a specific um, treatment, a specific provider, um, or if we we're also referring to like external network, um, maybe it's who who in your your network can um, be a support to you right now. Those can be um, lots of good questions. Assess or try to find her level of knowledge regarding her condition. Yeah, yeah. What is what does she think is going on? Um, helping her, helping her, you know, physically make that call to the doctor for an appointment. Um, give praise. I love that for not wanting her health to get worse and for reaching out to ask what she can do and support her by going with her to some appointments. Yes, that's great. Ask if they've discussed it with their PCP. Yes. Ask if there's assistance. A lot of people saying, you know, ask, asking if they can provide assistance and scheduling an appointment. That's like, it's such a small thing, but honestly, I think it's just, it shows how much you care and how you're willing to just, you're not trying to fix the situation, but you're saying like, let's start here and I'm happy to help you do this. I think that's really wonderful. Um, what has she found helpful? Build on that. Great. What does she feel like her strengths are at the time? Yes, we're actually going to talk about that. Um, oh, someone said that's exactly how they feel in reaching out to a provider with such underwhelming but disturbing symptoms. It seems that's it seems like, yeah, it seems I'm going to use your word whiny, but I get it. Like it feels like it's not serious enough to elicit um, physically reaching out to a provider. There are so many coming in. I love, thank you so much for, for, re, for putting your stuff in the chat. These are awesome answers. I really appreciate the participation. I'm going to keep going so that we can get through all the slides, but I encourage you all to like go and read your colleagues responses. They're really wonderful. So these are some, some, some suggestions that Let's say you set Carla up with an appointment or maybe you attend with her. Um, these are some suggestions for her or whoever the individual is. I'll just use Carla because we've been talking about her. Um, to say these are these are these are ways that they can sort of actively be good communicators with their provider to get their questions answered or to share their concerns. So I feel like this medication isn't helping my depression. And it's also making it really hard for me to function because I'm so sleepy and I take it. Like, can we talk about my options? That may be really hard for someone to voice because they feel like, well, this is what I'm supposed to be taking. This is the, this is what they gave me. And we hear that all the time. 
um, they know, you know, they need to know that there's options and they need to know that they get to be a part of their care by asking these questions. Um, so these are these are some kind of suggestions that maybe you could have when you're having those preparate, like kind of preparing for someone to go to an appointment. Um, letting them know that it is okay to ask questions, it is okay to clarify, it is okay to share that whatever has been prescribed to them or um, made a part of their treatment plan. If it's not working, it's not working. Again, having an effective treatment plan that works is a critical component of treatment and recovery. Uh, let's talk about emotional and social support. Um, loneliness and isolation are very common. We've talked a lot about that. And emotional support from members of a care team can make a huge difference. Um, this individual said that one of the things that really made them feel better was just hearing their psych psychologist say that their feelings were justified. They felt like they weren't doing everything wrong. And again, with these two illnesses, there is so much self-blame. So it is just so nice to just validate people and say, this is really hard. I'm I'm so sorry that you're struggling right now. Like, let's, let's talk about this and see how we can um, try something new. The time that is spent with the care team is actually, it, it's not actually, it's very minimal in, in comparison to the time that they're spending with their loved ones, their peers, at home alone in their own space. Um, and so that empowerment we talked about before of getting people to kind of overcome some of the challenges of self-directed medical care um, is huge because they have to do that on their own time. Um, so their loved ones and their peers can play a, re a really important um, role in adherence to treatment plans and that person's individual goals. So an example is like, if someone were talking to a peer, they could say, like, how did you get started with exercise? Like, I have nowhere, I have no idea where to begin. Maybe it's a gym that they like. Maybe there's a um, walking club that they like to attend. Asking peers those questions can feel like there's it's just way less pressure. So you can refer patients to peer support groups. There's a wonderful study of a peer support group for Mexican-American elders who were looking to improve their management of their type 2 diabetes. And they found that peer with the peer support group only, there was improvement in blood sugar levels. And that was really um, tied to... A, the um, increased confidence that those individuals felt with the resources they had at home to manage their diabetes um, and the ability to like just kind of manage the, the condition, the feelings of being overwhelmed every day, sort of those day-to-day -day stresses. They felt like they had, they were more resourced in those areas and that helped them as a group um, improve their blood sugar levels. So we cannot um, state the importance of peer support groups and, and peer support. You can engage loved ones in care why involve their family? Um, mental illnesses affect an entire family. It really can rock a home. Um, and in general, serious illnesses, like nobody gets through it by themselves. They need support. They need loved ones around them who care about them. Um, especially for people with mental illnesses, the families often provide the main source of caregiving um, and they really help fill in those gaps in service. So they're at home helping these folks with their treatment plans. They're their nutrition, they're cooking with them. Um, they may be the ones providing transportation. They may be the ones providing childcare. So engaging the family so that the families feel like they're part of this um, is also really helpful. And we actually have an entire class at NAMI on engaging loved ones in care. So you can always reach out if you're interested. Um, lastly, building some confidence. Um, distress influences self-efficacy. Um, right? So there's lots of good data on how distress impacts uh, self-efficacy. Um, knowledge is power. Educate um, the people that you're working with, educate the families, educate, if you if you work with their providers, you can educate their providers on maybe something they don't know about other stuff going on in the care team. Um, build self-esteem. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy really focuses on building self-esteem. So maybe this individual needs to pursue um, talk therapy, um, self-esteem, in, in order to build self-esteem, celebrate wins. Um, we, someone in the comments earlier mentioned acknowledging strengths and building on strengths that is huge in, in supporting self-esteem. Help them understand that they can confront and tackle difficult situations. And, and the difficulties that they're going to see are just temporary setbacks. I'm kind of speeding through this because we're low on time. Um, here are some questions. Here are some just examples of how you can validate and celebrate their successes. Um, you can validate some of their challenges. Here, here's some questions for them. You know, what has been your biggest success so far? Um, 
relive this feeling. Think about it. You know, maybe they're calling you to say that they feel really great about how their treatment plan's going. Celebrate them. Tell them to close their eyes and and really feel this feeling. Um, and then later on, if they're looking for sources of motivation, um, maybe they're experiencing a setback. Talk about what what are things that you feel like you can achieve now that a year ago you never would have thought possible. Um, those things are really going to help kind of bring them back to, I can do this. Um, I have done this. Um, but if I'm struggling right now, it's also okay. Setbacks happen. The care team, everybody who interacts with the individual themselves, it's the family, the peers, they have to be okay with the fact that setbacks happen. People experiencing a mental illness may decide they just don't want to participate in their care. Um, that can be really hard. Um, but for those who are participating, even if it's not like fully involved, they're not a medical self-advocate yet, but they're participating, they can still experience setbacks. Um, what does help is empathy, listening, cooperating, some of those setting shared goals, just, um, uh, shared decision making, but what is not going to work is like bullying, having everybody come and say, "Well, what did you expect?" You know, like group trying to do group interventions or you know really um, ganging up on somebody, um, confronting them really aggressively, forcing something upon them um, or guilting them into something. None of those things are going to work. Um, you need to work alongside this person and walk this path with them um, and, and celebrate their wins and validate the times that they're struggling and get them back on the path. Lastly, have some resources on hand. There's so many good resources, um, but past successes, especially if that person went and wrote them down when you were asking that, like, think about your, how you feel right now. Bring that up. Let's let's go back to that time that you had that you were feeling really good about your treatment plan. What let's see what you felt. Um, that can really remind them of their ability to manage their symptoms and work towards recovery. And remember that individuals with mental illnesses are resilient. They live with really hard symptoms every day, and they're here. Um, so act on that. They they are resilient. Um, if you want to refer them to Nami Minnesota, we have classes. Um, Hearts and Minds is a group uh, is a, a, a five week class where we actually work on all the tools we talked about today. So um, we they go through five sessions where we talk about nutrition, sleep, medical self advocacy, managing medications. Um, if if smoking is an issue, we talk about smoking cessation. Lots of things. We have peer support groups. We have over sixty support groups in the state of Minnesota. So there's a support group happening every day. Um, refer them to a support group. Also, lots of diabetes um, education programs. Someone mentioned that earlier. Um, so refer them there. Um, American Diabetes Association has lots of great tips too. And then if somebody is in crisis, um, having crisis resources on hand too is great. On the NAMI Minnesota website, we have a crisis resource handout with everything you need to have. So you can go right to our website, type crisis resource, um, or there's even a crisis button, and it'll take you to a front back handout. So we only have a couple minutes left. I, this is actually, we had really good discussion. So we're at the end. Um, but these were some of the questions I wanted to leave you with. If there are any questions you want to pose into the, um, or, or answers to these questions you want to put in the chat, or if there's questions that you have for me, um, I'm going to turn it over to the coordinators to kind of like close us out, um, acknowledging that I'll be here a little longer, but that people have things they need to do with their day. But these are some of the questions I'd love you think about. Great. Thank you so much, Molly. Thanks, um, Gina. Yeah, it was just, you know, um, I, I know I learned a lot and uh, it was great discussion. We have a really smart group here who had a lot of great comments. Yes. Um, Lots so, of great comments. So, much. so the uh, evaluation, uh, we hope that you uh, complete it. Once you complete your evaluation, then that's when your certificate of participation will pop up. Um, so I think the next slide, Molly, is mm -hmm. shows that. I actually have my contact info. And then this one. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, so the evaluation will pop up. You'll get a certificate of participation. And then there is a recording of this um, webinar um, that is will be posted um, at the, the link 
um, that will, I don't know, does that link? You'll get a copy of the PowerPoint and you can, you can click into that. Yes. So in the, in the PowerPoint, you can like click it. Yeah. And then it okay. looks like Jenna also put the evaluation link in the chat. Great. Yes. And then we will also send out um, a reminder email with the evaluation link um, with the slides might take the slides and recording will take a few days to be uploaded, but we'll send you the link for that as well. Yeah. Um, and thank you. Yeah. Right. When you get the slides, my um, one of the last slides is uh, has my contact information. If you like if any of this, you just want to learn more or you have specific questions, please email me. I, I would love to hear from from you about the work you're doing or if there's any specific resources you're looking for. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, everybody, yes. for attending and Thank have you. a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your comments.